in the listen only mode. We're going to start the seminar. We're going to begin today. I want to uh, welcome everyone to today's seminar. My name is Nancy Holm, the seminar series organizer. Um, we have the schedule for the spring semester of our seminar series up on the side table if you'd like to pick that up as you exit. Our next seminar will be on uh, February 14th on algal biofuels and uh, using algal biomass for energy. If you'd like to send that or watch it online, we do show all of our webinars online and they're archived on our website afterwards. Uh, for those listening online, which we have a number of people online today, uh, you can visit our website to get a listing of those upcoming seminars. Uh, we'll hold any questions to the end today for the seminar, and those online can type in their questions and then we'll read, read those. That way uh, it flows um, a little better and, and then we can have all the questions at the end. And then so today um, we're very pleased to have with us uh, Chris uh, Spriak, uh, who's president of Adaptive Arc. Uh, Chris brings a record of entrepreneurial successes to Adaptive Arc that draws on his experience from Wall Street to Silicon Valley. Uh, before his role as president at Adaptive Arc, he held the same position at clearstation.com, which is a web-based investment research firm. And after 18 months of aggressive, Chris guided the sale of that company to E-Trade Financial. Uh, prior to this work, uh, Chris worked at his first startup company, Capital Technologies, which developed SiteLock, a uh, remote network administrative platform for over 100 professionals, and FogLight, a proactive network monitoring system. Prior to these ventures, Chris worked at Sun Microsystems and Goldman Sachs, where he worked directly with Fisher Black in the Quantitative Strategies Group and built on one of Wall Street's first uh, fully electronic uh, trading systems. So he received his BS degree in Economics and Mathematics from King's College. So with that, I'd like us to please welcome Chris. Well, thank you very much uh, for having me here today. I'd like to especially thank uh, Luis Rodriguez um, and the Illinois uh, Sustainable Technology Center. Uh, I'd like to also uh, thank uh, George Voss, uh, who's our representative here. Um, and I'd like to thank the, the staff, the scientists uh, that I've met today, the administrators, academics. Um, working with academia is an absolutely critical part of our business. Uh, we have been involved with quite a few universities from the very beginning, starting with the University of Nuevo Leon in Monterrey, Mexico. Uh, this is an important technology that uh, is uh, highly disruptive in its market space which is uh, sustainability. And I'm going to begin the presentation today by focusing on sustainability itself. I'll then move into our technology as a science, then uh, from an engineering perspective, and then finally what we're doing as a business. Should take about 45 minutes uh, before we're all done. And of course, um, what I love most about these presentations is the questions. I handed out a bunch of notepads. There's a couple more here. So if you have some questions, please jot them down, and uh, we'll, we'll cover those at the end. So what we create is sustainable infrastructure. And there is a question uh, to what both of those words mean. But uh, sustainability is a, a critical issue at this point in our history. Uh, we have everything's moving faster. Technology is better. Uh, but there is a real question as to what the impact is to society, to the environment, and economics, even though that seems to be the, the center of everything, uh, as to how these things get integrated. What we do with our technology, which uh, is based on uh, an engineering principle we call pool plasma, uh, is convert primarily waste, but really any carbonaceous feedstock, into clean energy and commercial materials. Uh, I'm going to go into why we use plasma arc, but the short story to that is you can put just about anything in this machine. One of the ways I like to describe it is it is the Hail Mary pass in the industrial commercial product cycle. Uh, we are the low cost leader. Once you learn a little bit more as you will today about what plasma arc gasification is, everyone would do it if it was affordable. And really we 
we'll talk about science, we'll talk about engineering, but at the end of the day, it's affordable. It's really that economic piece. Uh, without subsidies, we are just deploying this right now around the world. We're in more than 170 sites right now in some form of con contract negotiation where there are no government subsidies for renewable energy, clean energy, waste diversion, any of these uh, issues. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but uh, I have to say as we move into the area of, of, uh, of our society now where government is out of money more or less permanently and not just in the United States, uh, that is a real critical requirement for any sustainable, any technology that can be called sustainable. Importantly, we have been demonstrated at commercial scale. We've been operating in Mexico in two sites. Our pilot plant is in Monterey, Mexico. Uh, our first full-scale com commercial production site, commercial prototype, is in Mexico City, uh, where we have demonstrated not only the scale up from our prototype, but also all forms of uh, intersections of use with industry. The technology is easy to permit and it's easy to finance owing to its modular scale, its, its modular design. So here's a picture of the plant at Mexico City in full production. There, for example, uh, at 3,000 meters in altitude, almost uh, 9,000 feet, uh, we've proven a, an energy output with uh, 100 tons per day of continuous 420 uh, uh, kilowatts. Uh, the site operates uh, during daylight hours, so it shuts down and turns on during peak, peak usage. This is another um, outstanding attribute for a, a plasma arc gasifier. Uh, we've proven our mass energy balance, our operational costs, and importantly, we've run a lot of stuff through the system there. Everything from manure, um, biomass in the form of wood chips or green waste, um, hazardous waste, industrial, etc. It's been a wonderful proving ground. And I'm going to talk about Mexico City a little bit more. But let me start by saying what our business proposition is to our customers. Uh, when we look at a university campus like we're on today, um, a hospital, military, uh, any form of industrial park, or even transfer station, a waste transfer station, or a wastewater uh, management plant, they all look at their waste today as a liability. It's on the expense side of the balance sheet. What we do with our technology is not just convert the waste into clean energy and recyclable materials, but we also turn a liability into an asset. And we do it on a, a workable scale for those institutions. Um, this is a wonderful advantage for those customers, but it is a completely opposite way of looking at waste and even clean energy. Um, the reason I'm focusing on sustainability so much these days is not so much because it's a big buzzword. It is. But what sustainability really is, is environmentalism with metrics. And when you take a look at everything, the social impact that a technology may have, the economic, of course, and the environmental impact, it's often not a zero-sum game. Often the introduction of technologies like ours, and what we're beginning to see, is that our customers are benefiting on all three of those scales. Now, before any, I go any further, I want to talk about who our partners are. Uh, our biggest partner in the United States and our biggest investor as a company is NRG Energy out of Princeton, uh, New Jersey. This is the largest independent power producer in the United States. Um, in the Midwest, uh, Alliance Federated Energy is a very important partner of ours. CP Group out of Southern California um, uh, is the, one of the largest uh, recycling manufacturing, recycling equipment manufacturers in the world. And the important thing about CP Group is they do end-to-end. -end. They manufacture every single thing from the conveyor belts, the, uh, the glass, the recycling pieces, all of it. And uh, the reason I point that out in detail is that no matter where they go, there is always something left over. So we are the caboose, really, on that on that very important train. And I mentioned in the beginning uh, sustainability business management by George Voss, who's our representative here at the um, University of Illinois. Now, <clears throat> I said before, sustainability is environmentalism with metrics. Um, that doesn't diminish environmentalism. Environmentalism is an aspiration. They are pointing to where we need to go, and that is the first step. Uh, everybody generally wants zero waste, minimal impact, uh, full life cycle planning for the products that we buy so that we don't have to worry about it. Somebody else thought about it first. 
around the world, and I will say 80% of our business is outside of the United States, environmental justice is a really important part of how we're bringing our projects uh, to life. The simple fact of the matter is that poor people live near the garbage. That's the way it is now, and that's the, the way it's, it, it is all around the world. So technology like ours, the Asian American Development Bank has a wonderful paper, and it's echoed in World Bank papers and other uh, UN publications. The number one way to mitigate poverty is get rid of the garbage and provide electricity. It's even before the water management piece, because you can't pump the clean water in or filter it without the electricity. You can't keep the medicine cold without the electricity. And our technology does both. It is genuine sustainability infrastructure. Um, sustainability really consists, it's composed, it's fabric, is pragmatic and realistic solutions. Pragmatic and realistic policies. policies. What can be done today? What can be done in five years? Um, it's really making the plan rather than saying, where are we going? All right? Environmentalists are sort of saying where we're going. Now here's the plan to get there. And that's an important distinction. One thing that I have seen about uh, sustainability is it is remarkably different between here in Champaign, Illinois, and in Chicago, and in LA, and in Southern California, where I live. And it's radically different if you go to Hawaii, where you really can't sell recycled materials, or even the United Kingdom, a very large economy, but you, there's really not a great, uh, there's no recycling market. Um, importantly, some places, like say Tuvulu, which is an island in the South Pacific, has had a certain lifestyle for centuries. And with five more years of landfilling on that island, that lifestyle is over forever. So when they look at their waste, when they look at sustainability, they're looking at it very different than we are today in Champaign, Illinois. Now, all of those perspectives are important. But there's a couple of facts that, uh, that it can be used to guide this. First of all, every ton of waste produce, produces at least a ton and a half of greenhouse gases, up to two I've seen in some studies. Um, and that doesn't even include the transportation costs for moving that stuff around. So waste is an important part of sustainability for industry. You cannot get a building built today without looking at the uh, environmental impact. You have to get the water in. You have to get the clean water out. 50% of garbage is water. Why are we hauling it around and putting all these greenhouse gases in the air away from the place that needs it when that can be recovered locally? That's what Adaptive Arc does. That's what our technology does with the CE25, which is the first of our product line. But because all of these sustainability issues are so important, uh, we have uh, been working with the University of California uh, at San Diego to create something we call the Sustainable Foundations Program. Now, we're not the only foundation, but waste clearly and energy is part of that. Water management is part of it. Transportation, uh, affordable housing. What the Sustainable uh, Foundations Program really is is just a wiki, but it's a wiki where you have private companies, you have cities, and you have international organizations, including environmentalists, that are coming in to write sustainability statements that work for their communities, for their companies. So I invite you, uh, as the university and, and everyone who's listening on the webinar, to join us at this website. Help us build this wiki together. It's a very modern approach to a problem that's absolutely global. The fundamental issue when we talk about greenhouse gases and sustainability is pollution, and waste is pollution. Um, even the most modern landfills in the world, and here's a picture of the Otay Mesa landfill in Southern California. It is built to Southern California, American EPA standards, and you can see the scale of this operation. Look at the, the people down there just look like little ants, right? That was five years ago. This is today. I estimate there's about five to seven million tons of landfill in that space right now. And take a look at the difference. You can't even see the people anymore when you look at them from that perspective. Now, every, the EPA concedes that every landfill, not some, every landfill will leach into the water table. I told you 50% of uh, landfills water, right? Where's that water going? Um, there are more than 3,000 reported and probably many more not reported landfill fires in the United States of the best landfills in the world. Um, the number one leading source of dioxins and furans in the atmosphere is the uncontrolled burning of waste. And I'm just talking about the United States now. I'm talking about 
the most modern economy. Now, I have a lot of words that I can use to describe what we call the modern approach to landfilling today, but sustainability is definitely not one of them. The other side of this coin is, okay, well, so what? So what about that? We have recycling. I separate my paper and my plastic, and I do the curbside bit, and believe me, CP Group is grateful because this is a big part of uh, the recycling program. It is important to do that to get the recyclables out of the waste stream so they can efficiently return those materials back to industry. And a clean material recycling facility can recover up to 90% of what shows up at its door. That's curbside waste. You can get up to 90%. That's fantastic. Raw waste showing up at these same facilities, and this is a C, uh, CP group design here at the bottom here, can recover up to 80%. Another fantastic number. In California, which has the highest recycling rate in the United States and some of the most stringent both standards and goals, we are still landfilling 43 million tons a year. Well, we can do something about that. In Mexico City, we haven't just talked about it. We're not just talking the talk. We're walking the walk. We have proven at our site that 100% is possible. If every, 600, every one of the 600 tons of waste that shows up at that site is hand recycling, providing uh, good jobs for the community. Um, the paper and plastic, et cetera, is all uh, sent back to uh, the manufacturing economy of Mexico, and it works. The food, which is a really big part of developing world waste streams, usually 50%, is converted not into a compost, not into a mulch, but to a probiotic fertilizer with extraordinary uh, restorative characteristics for over-farmed land. It's called Natura Bono, and it's a big part of what we're doing in Mexico and as we expand in Latin America, and especially uh, economies where water, where water is, is essential. What's left after that process we call the waste of the waste. It is uh, really just a lot of plastics, a lot of these films and uh, plastic bags that you just can't get out. <clears throat> There's always going to be a little bit left over, and that's what America converts into not only recovered metals and clean materials, but importantly, clean energy. <clears throat> and what about this? How, how, how are we doing this at such a small scale with such a big impact? The best analogy I can think of is the transition we went through in the 80s from mainframe to PCs. When this docile little PC showed up on the computer industry, no one expected that the mainframe was going to disappear, just like no one expected that today your phone is more important than your laptop. I mean, who saw that coming? But that is exactly what distributed waste management and distributed uh, power generation is. For example, in Mexico City, we have a proposal with the, the DF to put one CE25 in each of the 13 transfer stations. There's 23,000 tons of garbage moving through uh, Mexico City now, primarily going to a landfill that was closed 10 years ago called Puerto Poniente. Well, we've already proven that by just putting one of our machines, think about how little that impact is, uh, but by reducing transportation costs, by uh, doing this local energy production, we're reducing uh, the expense of hauling that waste around, reducing the traffic on the roads, and uh, providing local energy and reducing greenhouse gases by 7%. These systems are not supported by subsidies. They pay for themselves by the recovery of the materials and the sale of the um, energy. Now, our goal is to turn every single one of them into local waste management, local uh, power generation and recycling facilities. Uh, Mexico City isn't the only model. We have proposals in Naples, Italy, in Jakarta, and several other cities around the world. This is the way waste management is going in the future. Now, I don't spend as much time talking about distributed energy, but let me just say the story this way. There's only so much wind and solar on the roof. And if you know that as a company, you're producing an enormous amount of waste, then you have locally, right at your own resource, the, the ability to not only recover those materials, those sellable materials, but power uh, your industry itself. In fact, there's a very high relationship between waste production and energy consumption in industry. Whether it's a hospital, an industrial park, wastewater processing plants, which along with landfills happen to be the largest pol polluters in almost every community in the world. But this is the way to mitigate those impacts more or less immediately, and to do it in a dis distributed way. Now, there are projects out there, $100, $200 million projects, to build large incinerators, to put the garbage in those. It's my belief 
and what I'm sharing with you as a sustainability manager today is that those guys are going to have a hard time getting the feedstock because frankly we're moving from PC, no, mainframe to PC and PC to, uh, to mobile phone with waste and with distributed energy. Now, what is gasification? Uh, it's a firm I'm, for, term I'm really familiar with, but let me just do the one-on-one -on, -one on it. Gasification is a process uh, that's been used commercially in the United States for more than 180 years. The first uh, street lamps in New York City were uh, powered by uh, coal gas, which is a process of bringing uh, coal up to, or any material up, to a very high temperature in the absence of oxygen. When you do that, it does not burn, it does not combust or incinerate. It creates a byproduct, uh, which in the case of New York City was a producer of gas, in our case is a refined fuel called syngas. Now if you just look at the basic chemistry on this and the difference between burning something and gasifying it, the difference is really clear. First of all, with cool plasma gasification, we are creating carbon monoxide. It's a carbon, uh, it's a molecule that wants that oxygen, it will combust with a catalyst. When you burn something, you're creating carbon dioxide. Hydro hydrogen, you get uh, a fuel, hydrogen uh, is just H2. Uh, the two biggest out, uh, byproducts of combustion are carbon dioxide and water. We, we more or less all know that. Um, there's a lot of issues with what happens with the solids when you burn materials. In our process, all the solids are recyclable. Importantly, gasification creates fuel. Our final product is syngas, which is primarily hydrogen and carbon monoxide. In the process of incineration or really burning anything, the final process is carbon dioxide and water, and it creates dirty exhaust, which then must be cleaned. Now, the next question is then, why plasma arc? And plasma arc is a relatively new engineering technology in gasification. I'm going to walk through some of the evolution of this, but the short answer is it can handle anything. It can handle medical, toxic, um, simple, easy materials like uh, biomass, wood chips. We can get uh, per petroleum sludge, which may be highly chlorinated, um, and uh, process that and basically create table salt out of the chlorine. That's the bottom line. Now. Uh, the benefits, of course, is, uh, are the safe disposal, uh, the production of this uh, energy, but also uh, the way that it works uh, on, uh, within the local economies. At the end of the day, it's really simple. Plasma gasification is not incineration. There's nothing even close to it in the process because at the end of the day, we're simply creating fuel. Now, here's a picture of our uh, system as it arrived at the University of California in Riverside. Uh, which is our uh, test facility at the, at the current moment, and you can see how compact this thing is. It's designed to fit to the format of a Connex shipping container. So everything is built 40 by 11 by 11. It's modular, and the way that we've thought of not only delivering the machines, but doing site planning is kind of the way you do memory in a computer. We have a design for 25, 100, 250 tons per day, and these things can be put next to each other. Right? So you can start with a single machine. Well, let's put it this way. When you buy memory, you might have a chip that has you know, one gigabyte or five gigabytes. It doesn't matter. You kind of do your planning for what you need, and you put it in and out as you need it. And that's really the fundamental design. Now, <clears throat> I, I mentioned I'd tell you just a little bit about the history of how we got to where we were. Now, it's really incineration is a real popular management of waste, and I don't want to say too many negative things about it. Uh, because, in fact, modern incineration is relatively clean, and it does divert waste from the landfill, which is far more toxic. But there have been improvements to what can be done with waste. The first step is pyrolysis. Now, pyrolysis is a precursor. It's a, it's a, a step before gasification, and, it, and there are, it's very popular with agricultural waste. In fact, I saw a pyrolysis machine this morning. Uh, here at the university. Um, and it is a better approach. Now, plasma gasification came online about 10 years ago with companies like um, Alter Energy and the Westinghouse process, and it has proven to be very clean. It has proven to be the wet, best way to manage waste and securely divert waste from the landfill, but it's expensive. So the process that we call cool plasma really consists of using all of the characteristics that come out of a plasma torch. I told you gasification is a process where you bring things to a very high temperature, you starve it of oxygen, 
Well, plasma can reach temperatures literally on the sun. So plasma torches can and do, at other facilities, go up to three to 5,000 degrees centigrade. I mean, these are very high temperatures. We don't have to because we are using another characteristic of the torch called pulse plasma energy. Now, every torch, when every plasma spark, even the spark plug in your car, when it creates that arc, emits some very low-level uh, pulses. Uh, you can call them shock waves or gamma waves. There's a certain way to characterize these uh, waves. Um, our inventor, Christian Yuvon, was doing an experiment using UV light uh, to inhibit a reaction in sewage sludge um, many years ago, when, uh, almost <laughs> 35 years ago. I don't want to give too, late, late too much on his age. Um, and when he was doing his experiment, the experiment worked, but he also noticed at the end that all the bacteria was dead in the sewage sludge, and he didn't know why. He developed this a little bit more and saw that he was using an application of a plasma torch that had never been done before. It was evolved a little bit more commercially, and now we call it food irradiation. If you've ever bought a, a carton of milk that didn't need to be refrigerated in a store, like a par Parmalat or something like that, that's Christian. Uh, that is a non-thermal use of a plasma wave to kill all the bacteria and milk, sewage, sludge, etc. And it's a massive improvement. Christian improved this technology to do things like segregate um, uh, chromium from refinery sludge, so there's never going to be any more Aaron Brockovich cases. He's even developed a technology that segregates gold in a process called liquid gold mining. Now, all of that technology over all these decades, uh, Christian has had to make gasifiers. And really, this particular gas fire, this process, the cool plasma process, is the fruition of all of that work. What we do is we create a plasma field at the top, not the bottom, where most gasification occurs in most gas fires, at the top of the chamber. We create a, a process for recirculating materials through that plasma wave and through, through some other um, chemical reactions. And in fact, what happens is that the UV light the plasma pulses are doing a lot of the work, about 30% of the work that is only used where, where in other processes you only have high temperatures. You now have the full dynamics of this plasma torch uh, to work on, what's, uh, on what needs to be done to break apart these materials quickly in a miniaturized way and very efficiently from a, a, a resource point of view. Now, here's a picture of a man who's got his hand directly on the torch when it's in operation. Uh, about 10 inches from his hand, it's about 1,300 degrees centigrade or 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So the question is, how do you do that? How do you move the plasma field or the heat manifestation away from the source itself? And the short answer to that question is pulse plasma, plasma pulses. It's an electromagnetic field. In this uh, picture and in the video I'm showing you here, uh, we're in air. We're in the environment. There's oxygen there. Inside of our plasma chamber, it's oxygen starved. So you're not, you're not seeing a combustion like you see in this video, but you can see in this video that the uh, instrument, the temperature sensor on the end is white hot. So you know it's at least 800 degrees centigrade. And here we have uh, the CEO, Gabriel Jeb, of our company and uh, one of our customers putting his hand on the machine that's just a little bit hotter than uh, this podium here is at room temperature. This is a great breakthrough for many reasons, not the least of which is the lifetime of a typical plasma orch, torch and one of the leading operations and maintenance costs for plasma gasification is the replacement of the electrodes in the torch. Our torch is already proven in Monterey, Mexico to last more than five years with a very little wear and they consume only two kilowatts continuous to operate in a manner that ordinary torches require much more power. Now that's the torch. Uh, the gasifier itself, using the characteristics of this torch, does a couple of operations that just aren't possible with a ordinary updraft or downdraft gasification. First of all, you can see from this picture that it is a top-fed gasification system. Uh, we use uh, gravity. We have a gravity-fed system, and as the materials pass from liquid to solid, uh, rather from solid to liquid to gas, and then finally to a plasma state we create um, an oxygen seal on the top of the gas fire, keeping oxygen out of the bottom. It's a very, very simple design. I'm going to explain that loop in a minute, but what we're doing inside the gas fire is recirculating the materials. First on a vertical basis, where we're passing it through a dry sorbitant injection system uh, and a number of other fuel uh, cleanup techniques. 
and then also on a horizontal basis, which is literally pushing heavier materials out to the edge and lighter materials into the center. Now the syngas as it comes out of this process is cleaner than syngas that comes out of most gasifiers after they've gone through all of their scrubbing process. The gasification in traditional process uh, is going to create a producer gas with a lot of tars and things you just don't want in the syngas. But owing to this invention we call the squid, which I'll show you in a minute, we clarify the syngas in the gasification chamber. Now the impact here is all economic because we've talked in just the description of the torch and the beginning of this process for generative cleaning, we've eliminated 50% of the cost in an ordinary plasma art gasification plant. Now, we do have to fast quench this uh, gas because it's very hot when it comes out, and we do do a secondary cleanup. We don't assume we got it all. Then, typically, we'll create electricity, but we don't always. Don't forget, our product is syngas. Now, we've modified ordinary Caterpillar gen sets to run on syngas, on our syngas, and we've worked with Waukesha and Mitsubishi and a couple reciprocal engines. There's a couple of reasons we use reciprocal engines, but at the end of the day, what we're able to do is get a permit for a well-known genset, a Caterpillar 1 or 2 megawatt genset that is already to, permitted to run on tier 3 or 4 on diesel, which is a very dirty fuel. When you substitute that dirty fuel with a clean syngas, all your criteria emissions are going to be lower. NOx, SOx is virtually non-existent all of these uh, uh, typical trace emissions that we look for in combustion emissions are much, much lower than on diesel. Diesel's a dirty fuel. It comes out of the ground. We should throw it in a gasifier and clean it before we use it. But in this process, we can use really anything. Now, what happens to the exhaust, right? This is a combustion process. We're creating water and carbon dioxide. We route that back into the gasifier. Our gasifier actually likes water. We operate best between 35 and 50 percent water, which happens to be the average range of garbage. We use that water to create more hydrogen, to create more carbon monoxide, and it's an essential part of the um, cogeneration of fuel with our process. Now here's a look inside the machine. I told you there were a couple of different chemical reaction zones and this uh, thing we call the squid that uh, moves the materials around. So first as materials come around, I'll point out the torches are here. So obviously we have a very high temperature zone at the beginning. This is where pyrolysis begins. This is where we're moving from uh, our solids to liquids to gaseous state. By the time materials uh, move down here, they are both gasified and beginning to become highly ionized. Now there is a process in gasification of plasma state. Plasma state is, uh, you know, you've got solid, water, gas, plasma, the electrons just don't know how to go back home. And plasma physics are very different from the physics of those other states of matter. Uh, in many ways, it makes some of what we do that's hard to describe much, much easier. That plasma state is an essential part of what we're doing with our gasification process. Now, as we process the materials down here, we're routing them selectively into the plasma field. But importantly, we're passing them with these middle arms here between these top two layers where we've built a, a char layer. We have a process called a water gas shift reaction, which is creating our syngas primarily from water and carbon dioxide. And in the process, we're keeping everything else in the gasifier. So everything you might be worried about, right, like mercury, what's happening to the mercury, the lead. Well, compare the weight, molecular weight of lead to hydrogen. Hydrogen is the lightest element. It's going to squeeze to the center of this thing. We will go up the tentacles of the squid and uh, be cleansed again before it leaves the gas fire. But at the end of the day, all that heavier stuff is tending to the side. There's an edge effect. We're, uh, as uh, the feedstock requires, we're adding things like um, baking soda, lime, trona, high sodium compounds. So if there's a lot of uh, chlorine, for example, we're going to create table salt out of that chlorine as you know, PCB laden. Um, refinery sludge saver is running through the system. This is a general purpose gasifier that once we do the analysis on the feedstock, we can tune for all sorts of situations. But at the end of the day, we sum it up, I sum it up this way. You take the whole periodic table of elements and just string it from heaviest to lightest. You've got it moving in the circle. The lighter compounds are just naturally going to go up and there's a mechanical test in here that helps us with that. Um, and the heavier stuff, the metals, et cetera, we're going to oxidize them. They'll come out as inert materials in a white ash 
So the metals are recoverable at this point. The white ash is highly valuable. It's much more valuable than, say, a slag or an obsidian that's uh, typical of plasma um, plants. So we don't have to worry about making you know, road aggregate or something. The same recycling plant that bought our equipment is going to sell those metals. They're going to sell the ash. And once again, it's going to be a premium product. It's not going to be some problematic you know, mulch that's really hard to sell. That is sort of the science and technology part of what we're doing. Uh, like I said, it, it really does come down to the fact that all these processes are important. We've just made them affordable. What we've done is we've integrated uh, more than 15 maximum available control technologies primarily into the gasification system itself. And that's what leads to the cost reduction. Now, when you're working with waste, you're working with uh, one of the largest greenhouse contributors. Uh, greenhouse gases are very high from waste because of the production of methane. Now, it's not just methane. There's about uh, 25 or, or, uh, or so compounds that have up to thousands of times of the heat shielding effect of carbon dioxide. But converting waste rather than just letting it stand for 20 or 30 years, where there's useful methane, right, in methane recovery, but after that, that curve ends pretty quickly. Uh, after that methane's all burned out and you can't run it through Genset anymore, you've got decades of carbon dioxide and leachates coming from that landfill. So just focusing on greenhouse gases, though, uh, if you take a look at 200 tons per day of untreated landfill and the vox that come in, uh, up with it, you're looking at a massive difference between processing that uh, with an adaptive arc technology and not. The methane, like I said, methane capture is useful. Uh, we should do it. Frankly, you should run it through our torch and then convert it to syngas. But the impact is, is very strong. Now, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on the energy balance part of this, but I do want to point out just uh, one or two things on this foil. First of all, uh, you're not going to get more energy out of a system than you put in. I mean, that's, that's a basic fact. We've demonstrated on a practical basis that we can deliver 500 kilowatts, more or less guaranteed, uh, if we have average uh, composition garbage. What is that? That's 4,000 BTUs per pound, or uh, about five or six uh, megajoules per kilogram. Uh, once you go through that, there's a few opportunities for energy loss. Right? The first conversion is going to be in the processing loss. The second is in the generator loss. The third is in the transformation and parasitic loss. In other words, the loss from running those plasma torches themselves. Now, in the CE25, we have three torches. There's three that are always on that are part of the gasifier. And then there's actually uh, six total because we have three that do sort of uh, auxiliary functions. Uh, if we're producing, say, at sea level, about uh, 640 kilowatts continuously, we're talking about a parasitic draw of about uh, 12 uh, kilowatts at the absolute maximum. Now, where most plasma arc uh, gasifiers break down is in that particular equation. It's not so much the known losses that go from converting from solid to gas and then uh, from syngas then to a combusted stage. It's really that last bit. It's that last piece where what, how much energy do you need to put into the system to keep the reaction going? And that's where, once again, we have the biggest breakthrough. Um, then the question is, well, how do I use it? <laughs> and where can I use it? Uh, the fact that it shows up on, a, uh, on the back of a semi-trailer is designed to be uh, installed in two days. You can really use it just about anywhere. Uh, six months after we have a down payment for a machine, we ship it ready to run and set up in two days. If it's a mobile system, we can break it down in a week and set it up somewhere else in two days. Uh, this has big implications for permitting. It is permanently temporary. If for any reason a uh, customer loses a permit at a site, well, he can move it somewhere. Uh, so this is a really uh, important differentiator. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this foil because all comparison foils between your technology and other technologies are self-serving, and this one is as well. But I do want to point out one or two other things, uh, mostly down here at the bottom. You know, there is no need to do things like refresh fi fire brick or put met coke into the system. A lot of uh, uh, other technologies are having to put basically coal in. You know, 60% of the energy val value is coal or met coke with a little bit of garbage on top of it, and then they have state-of-the-art French scrubbers on the end. And that stuff wears down the system. It's very expensive to maintain. 
And once again, uh, these are real practical issues uh, for thermal management of waste. Um, this is just a listing of our general specifications for planning, which uh, are available on demand. And uh, we have a, a little more than two dozen sites now uh, that we can use as a reference for planning, um, not the least of which is our site in uh, Riverside, California. Uh, it's been there since uh, August 2012. The primary purpose of the site is research and development, validation testing, and commercial acceptance. Um, as I said, we have a lot of these sites in negotiation uh, all around the world. Um, I'm not sure what to point out uh, on this foil in particular, except to say uh, maybe point to Japan. Uh, obviously, we had a tsunami there some time ago. There is a lot of waste piled up, just as there's a lot of waste in New Jersey right now from Sandy, and this is really problematic stuff. Nobody knows what's in it. It's a very unpredictable waste stream, very difficult to move once you pile it up. In Ishinomaki, Japan, which is just a harbor, they've piled uh, three to five million tons of this stuff up in just a big pile. And downwind from this <laughs> pile, you're emptying out communities, schools, hospitals, because of just the chlorine that's coming out and emitting into the air, not to mention the water and other environmental damage is destroying the communities. There aren't a lot of technologies out there that can handle this, and we are uniquely qualified to handle that waste. So that's a brief overview. I, I tried to touch on the issues, returning always to the notion of sustainability. Um, I'm very interested in your questions or comments. Um, I like to talk about this technology like it's you know buying an iPad, but this is a new technology. We're, we're very young in our technology adoption cycle. We have some critical, important, and I would even say uh, visionary investors in the company and partners working with us. Um, we are clearly into the commercial acceptance part of what we're doing as a technology, as an emerging technology, um, but we, we do have a long way to go. And working with uh, the university here in Illinois, this important part of the country, um, this important and wealthy part of the world, this is something where you know, we have an opportunity uh, just setting up a gas of fire here just putting it in um, a different environment with different waste streams is going to multiply in cities like Jakarta, in, in uh, towns throughout uh, Asia and, and India, where the waste is just piled, and it's in, literally in dumps. I like the word tierra de dero. It literally means dump place, um, you know, in Spanish. I mean, it's just these, these communities can be very difficult to walk through. But the things that we can do here with our uh, wisdom and intelligence and opportunity with this university, the great minds, um, it's really exciting to us uh, at Adaptive Arc, all of us as a business, and me personally, uh, just simply caring about how the planet's going to make it through the next century. So I'm very interested in your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we sell a general purpose gasifier, and as such, uh, it is configurable for whatever waste stream that you have or feedstock that you have. The price for a, a biomass system is going to be considerably lower than the price for a medical or waste system. In order to put a system, I need to know a few things. Uh, what is the energy value, the moisture content, the approximate uh, mix of plastics, metals, uh, et cetera, inside of it, preferably a, a chemical breakdown. 20%. After that, let me, let me go through the list. Um, then we need to know about material handling. We need to know the exact geography. We need to know the altitude for the energy systems, et cetera. So these are the things that we need to know to price the system. So the question is, can I buy one for a half a million dollars? No. <laughs> uh, yes, I realized that at the end, not the beginning. I'll definitely repeat the question. Yes. How many what? Okay. <clears throat> For power production. So the question is, um, and correct me if I didn't get it right, but the question is how many options do we have for power production uh, based off of the prepackaged options with the CE25? Is, 
Is that what I heard correctly? Yeah. Okay. Um, the standard configuration CE25 running low value high water waste, as I said before, will produce half a megawatt with a uh, Caterpillar 3500 series genset. So that is the plain vanilla starting point. However, uh, when you do a project and you're planning a project, uh, we tend to do different configurations um, because your infrastructure costs are fixed costs. They have to be optimized. There's labor costs. We do have consumables when we uh, put these things together. So what we found is there's a, uh, the, sort of all those lines kind of come together with 100 tons per day with mixed waste. And the genset is not on the skid in those configurations. The gasifier will have four CE25s and two uh, one megawatt gensets. So what I'm answering the question by saying, first of all, what the prepackaged option is, which is essentially 500 kilowatts continuous, versus once you get into this, the details, as I just said to this gentleman, um, that we tend to break it down a little bit because it is a general purpose gasifier. And that 100 tons per day, 2 megawatt, tends to be a real economic total cost of plant. Yes? So uh, two questions, really. Yes. How do you handle really dry material, uh -huh. low moisture content material? Yes. And what is the impact of a, a stream that's really homogenous? Mm -hmm. um, in this part of the country, we're really looking at biomass. Yes. Over on the ground and the process. Yeah. So the question, uh, the question is, what do you do with a low moisture feedstock? And number two, uh, are you the best choice, I think is what you're saying, for homogenous feedstock? Um, so on the low moisture part, the answer is pretty much universal. Add garbage. <laughs> um, water is 50% water, and there's a lot of it. Um, and I'm not being glib. I mean, we Mexico City, before we started operating there, uh, we didn't recognize how refined this waste stream was, and it's really low moisture. I mean, it's just plastic bags and little doodads and stuff. Uh, it's just stuff that's you know can't be recycled, right? So it's very low moisture. So what we did is we added uh, about a 50% mixture of the original feedstock with the green waste feedstock that would come in the door there, and that recipe, as we call it. Uh, is something we use in a lot of different scenarios. Now, I think the real question you're asking about homogenous feedstocks, you know, once again, the question goes back, well, what are you putting in? Uh, the biggest gasification company in the United States used to be EPI, Environmental Products of Idaho. They do tons of commercial grade um, uh, gasification systems. Um, it really boils down to economics. Uh, if for that situation, based on all the questions that I asked you on that question before, uh, ours is cheaper, then it's the best one. Um, for things like coal or coal ash, which has a, almost twice the energy value of garbage, uh, we're definitely the best choice, right? Because we can handle the mercury, we can handle all of the selenium, all these uh, you know nasty components that are in coal ash. So that's a homogenous waste stream. So is petroleum sludge. We talk a lot about our half-eaten sandwiches when we talk about garbage. But you've got to recognize that even though municipal solid waste is a big portion of the waste stream, it's only 25%. So the majority of what's garbage, of what needs to be disposed of, has some problematic element, even if it's homogenous. So I hope that answered your question. OK, great. Yes, in the very back. Uh, I don't know if you've got the summer for this, but it's a great city press. There's a massive problem. Sure. So the question is, um, here in the Midwest especially, there's a lot of uh, effluent, there's a lot of uh, waste that's produced from feedlots and it's high in uh, potassium and uh, certain, compa uh, certain elements and compounds that are uh, very difficult to manage. Um, I regret to say that we have not tested our system yet on those feedstocks. Now we, we have uh, talked to, I mean, you know, the EPA has legislated that you can't throw manure in the fields anymore, right? Um, so we talked to the Cattlemen's Association in uh, Kansas about two years ago and 
we, there was some talk about a pilot project. Frankly, I think your question is an excellent question for the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center. It's a question that can be answered here. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So um, I, don't, I didn't hear a question there, but I do want to make a comment, uh, which is that uh, the footprint for waste management is bigger than the foot on which any industry, agricultural or otherwise, sits. So for the Superfund, for Superfund resources, when a site is determined to be a Superfund cleanup site, uh, we use federal money to clean that up, and then we go recover that money from the industries that put all the, that used this waste disposal company or whatever it was to get rid of this uh, toxic waste in the first place, right? I mean, that's how the Superfund works. Now, I think you're describing in Chesapeake Bay uh, something where maybe we don't have those resources. But as a practical matter, as a, a, an aspect of sustainability management, right? I mean, the number, it's this environmental justice question that we're asking, right? These externalized costs, you always hear that in, in sustainable energy management. I had a conversation with one of the gentlemen who works with the Superfund just two days ago in Phoenix where he'd successfully recovered uh, funds for a cleanup project in South Carolina. And I said, what do you think it would do to your business if after you cleaned it up, you went back to these industries and said they could actually make money cleaning it up in the first place? So that's the dynamic, and I have to admit that I don't know the answer in agriculture or agricultural waste, but it's definitely one of the reasons that I'm here. Yes? On the equipment thing, so the peaking on the bus, what's your maintenance cycle? How often do you have to shut down to bring your own salt? How much capital goes into replacing maintenance? And, and so the question here is on operations and maintenance. How often do we shut down? Um, you know what, I, I think I can take the liberty of maybe uh, showing one or two photos. Uh, I don't know if I want to take the chance. Well, at the end of the day, um, there's two, uh, after the single gasifier system itself, uh, almost everything in, in the system is replicated. There's two of them. Uh, the main components are the quench and syngas cleanup. One of those needs to go down every day, and then the gasification chamber itself once a week. Now, those cleanup units are like kidneys. You only need one operating at a, at a time to stay in production. So we're really looking at a two hours of downtime per week. Now, as far as replacement parts, spare parts, consumables, things of this part, once again, varies very widely depending on what you're putting in it. There's a lot of metals going in. It's going to be different from, say, if you have mostly food waste or you know, some other you know, agricultural product. But that said, uh, generally, uh, the consumables, the spare parts, are very small. They, they amount to something like a dollar, a dollar two on a per ton basis with ordinary waste. So whenever we cite figures, whether they're price figures or uh, you know O&M figures, we're always talking about garbage the way it shows up at most landfills. Uh, you know, 4,000 BTUs per pound, 50% water, 35% uh, uh, food. Um, with the, the usual plastic and, and metal ratios. So it's about two hours downtime. When we do the math, there's you know, what you call a Pareto optimality between uh, how much, uh, you know, my training's in math and economics, right? So, and I, I think sustainability is metric, so give me a little bit on that one. But anyway, you, know, you have your tip fee is sort of one side of the equation, and then the other side is electrical production, or let's just say energy production in general because liquid fuels are a very big part of this business. So is uh, specialized chemistry. Um, so as you do that balance on the whole, and really to answer the question about can you buy one for a half a million dollars, the real question is not how much is it, the question is how quickly does it pay for itself. And the general curve on that is if you're getting $64 uh, uh, on a tip fee and zero energy production, for some reason, you know, whatsoever, maybe you just have to flare the stim gas, something like that, then you're going to break even in three years. On the other side, if you're getting uh, 11 or 12 cents a uh, kilowatt for your power, you don't need any tip fee. So in between there, uh, and with all the various combinations, we're breaking even in about three to five years. Does that answer the question? Partial. Partial. Major overhaul. Major overhaul. Well, you know, there are, sure. 
there's only one part that needs to be replaced on a long-term basis, which is the refractory layer. Uh, but owing to the process of regenerative cleaning, and regenerative cleaning and everything that we have in that, and we haven't, uh, frankly, we don't have one in production for five years yet. We believe the operational time for that refractory layer is five years. Now we've been running in Mexico for two years now, so we kind of have a good idea that that's a right estimate. Um, and the whole system, within the system, the components are very modular. There's a couple screws on the bottom that drop off. You use a forklift, you take it out, put the new refractory layer in. We estimate one week of downtime on that one single item. Everything else is a module. You take it out. If something breaks, you take the module off, ship it to us, we ship, it the, we ship you the new module. It's all designed like Lego blocks for the most part. <coughs> Oh, online questions. Fantastic. Yes. Uh, what about organic compost? That's the highest threat and the cheapest materials. I am in the system and recycle only for materials I cannot be in use for recycle or compost, which means only about 15 to 20 percent of the streets. And, and were they able to hear you read that question? Um, um, yeah. So let me repeat it maybe the way that I heard it. Okay. So the way I heard the question is, um, uh, it sounds like there's a question and a belief. The belief is that um, all food should be converted to compost and that, uh, there's, that uh, only non-food products should be converted with this technology. And the sh is that the way it was phrased? Okay. And I say yes, if that's where you live. You have to remember that this question of sustainability is very, very different everywhere. Now, I lived in San Francisco for 20 years. They segment all of their food waste. They make a mulch out of it, basically, that they send up to wineries in Napa. Now, there's a lot of metals in that stuff. There's a lot of questions about the commercial viability of that product. I have seen many products that are much more valuable than mulch uh, or compost, including a Toro Bono. And now, a Toro Bono is fantastic because it's a pro probiotic uh, fertilizer that increases uh, aeration, uh, reduces the need for other caustic chemicals. And think about it, all the food we're eating was produced by industrial farming, right? So you take that food and you convert it into something that heals industrial farms. That sounds a little bit more valuable to me than, than compost. You're not going to do it in Fiji. You're not going to do it in Hawaii. You're not going to do it in Singapore. So this question of sustainability is the first question to ask. And I agree with the aspiration. Really, I don't think anyone disagrees with the aspirations of environmentalism. The question is, where is it most pragmatic here with my half-eaten sandwich? OK, great. Uh, the next question is, what is the ratio of tons of MSW and tons per pound of dry probiotic material out? OK, um, it depends on what you put in. But once again, we always go back to this sort of generic profile of waste as it shows up in the United States with that 4,000 BTU per pound and the usual plastic, et cetera. And uh, what we've seen through our operations in Monterey and in Mexico City is that about uh, the volume reduction is about 95%. Or another way to say it is that the residual is about 5 to 7%. Now, the next question is, uh, what can you do with that residual? And just to repeat what I said earlier, this is a white ash gasifier with a secondary process, not one we do in our gasifier, but with a secondary separation process, what's called a venturi cyclone. You can easily separate the ash from the metals, sell the metals, and then the ash, and basically zero extract. Um, the next one is a comment and then a question. The system may be practical and very crowded Well, uh, I think the first question is, uh, and once again, um, it's really important to understand the difference between centralized waste management and decentralized waste management. So we have these landfills, and apparently plenty of land, and maybe not a lot of regard for what happens to the water table, but 
that is what leads to these centralized waste management solutions. And it is economic today, and I'll tell you right now, there's an enormous amount of money invested by each of those participants in the waste trail to that one centralized location. The question is, is it practical for the waste producer to continue operating that way? Is it sustainable for them? Are they creating self-sufficient power? Or are they consuming coal or some other fossil fuel? Or do they have some other footprint that goes into their neighbor's yard? So we know how to make these landfills. We know what they cost. They cost about $16 a ton, right? That's what an average modern landfill costs with all of its problems. A lot of people have invested in that. A lot of people want to see that garbage continue to go there. The folks who don't are primarily the people who are paying for it, right? So if you have a large manufacturing uh, uh, site somewhere in the Chicago area, you're paying a lot to get rid of that waste and go create all those greenhouse gases. So what I'm trying to encourage everyone to do as I go around and speak is to really think a little bit differently about these problems. Because we do think, for example, when we talk about gasification, that these things belong in the landfills. They actually belong in your community. They belong in your neighborhood. These belong in the transfer stations where the waste is already being aggregated. And you shouldn't pay even the carbon cost of shipping it from that transportation to the landfill is a big greenhouse footprint. So it's, it's going to take a little time and maybe repetition to get to the point where we start thinking about distributed waste management and the carbon footprint in particular that it affords, not to say things like NOx and you know, precursors of uh, you know, emphysema and uh, breast cancer and all these mysterious diseases that show up when you all of a sudden build a you know, $500 million housing project on top of a landfill. And, you know, everyone ends up later saying, well, it's a mystery where all these diseases are coming from, you know. Um, believe me, these Chicago landfills are leaching into the water and they're on fire every single day. So if that's the preference or that's the societal choice, then I think we'll keep doing that. I just think we're at a different point in our evolution. <laughs> Yeah, uh, a question from the speakerphone. Yes, sure, Bill, go ahead. I, uh, I wanted to find out about the status of your work at Riverside, California. Sure. Okay, so um, what we're doing in uh, Riverside right now is essentially everything we did in Mexico, but we're doing it in California. So uh, we've had the opportunity in uh, Mexico to run all these waste streams do air emissions analysis and do solids analysis after the fact, mass energy balance. The difference is in Riverside we are working with the University of California, the community of Riverside, and with uh, the most respected hazardous waste testing agencies in the United States. For example, uh, the team that put together our uh, test plan with NRG is a company called NTEC. They are the leading hazardous waste incinerator testing consultants in the United States. And what they bring them with them is uh, companies like S4 that's going to spike the feedstock as it goes in with precursors of all kinds of contaminants. They're going to work with Yves Tandur, who's the world's leading expert on dioxins and purines, uh, to verify that we are not producing any of these kind of air emissions, solid emissions, approving the basically the economics, et cetera. Now, that said, we already did this in Mexico. <laughs> the problem is that even the Mexicans don't believe the data. So there's something about coming to the air quality uh, district in the United States that has the highest standards, uh, doing it with the test firms that have the highest credibility, and having no numbers produced by Adaptive Arc, having all of these numbers produced by third parties, agencies, with carefully monitored uh, conditions, and that's, that's what we're doing at Riverside. Now, in terms of time frame, there is no deadline, there's no date that I'm going to say that this work is going to be done, because the fact of the matter is, as we build each of these 170 sites, they have different requirements. So we're working, obviously, with the sites that we're doing first to satisfy their requirements. The EU has uh, uh, certain uh, requirements and certifications that are going to be met. We're going to meet them. Uh, in, in Riverside. Um, so that's what we're doing there. Any follow-up, Bill? What, the, what kind of timeline work you do? You said maybe you kind of answered that. You don't have a timeline. 
yeah, there's really nothing that, you know, I could say, hey, on this day, you know, come in because it's going to be shining, rising sun. You know, the fact of the matter is, is that this is a complicated business. The questions are technical and scientific, and they're easily misread. So as we go site to site, because the requirements are so different, it would be meaningless even if I gave you individual uh, dates on, on this. But that said, uh, we are rolling these out all around the United States, and those uh, jurisdictions have uh, responsibilities to publish data. We'll count on them as we continue to do this as their public service. And uh, certainly we'll be evolving the language on this uh, uh, Sustainable Foundations Project website where a lot of this information not is only going to come about adaptive art technology, but also all the other technologies that are out there. I'm a big supporter of recycling. I have to be. There are 80% of my customers. They're the ones who want this stuff most is the recyclers. Um, but in addition to that, this is an important forum for environmentalists, for uh, folks who live on you know, uh, 91st Street between 1st and 2nd Ave, where there's a transfer station, and they're learning an adaptive arc you know, machine is coming to their neighborhood. I mean, this is where you want to learn uh, about not just the impact of this, but you know, can that material go to an anaerobic digester? Should an anaerobic digester be on 91st Street in Manhattan? Um, I'm not going to answer that question. That's a community's question to answer. So that's, that's what we're trying to do with this program. <laughs> there are, uh, at each of those five stages of gasification, there are different temperature zones that do different things. The plasma zone, which is the one we talk about the most, is going to be running anywhere from uh, 8 to 1300 degrees centigrade, depending on the materials that we're processing. There's no combustion inside the system. Uh, so gasification is an oxygen-starved process, right? So if there were not to be uh, created, it would be from a stationary gen set that was burning the syngas. If we're working with, say, specialty chemo chemistry, if we're working with an optical technology that converts uh, syngas to light, if we're doing gas to fuels, then there's actually no combustion at the site at all. So there's really no opportunity for NOx. So one of your slides, you had a line slurry just before the injection. Yes. Now that contradicts the fact that you have a gas leaving the pyrolysis. Um, so you're actually, uh, <laughs> first of all, there is no slurry between injecting something into the syngas before it gets to the, uh, so the question is, are you uh, doing some kind of uh, slurry injection? Where's the diagram? This one, right? Okay, so uh, when so the question is, are you creating? What's the question? <laughs> how do you how do you clean your gas? Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to ask okay. you to listen to the lecture again because I walked through it with the squid and with the torches, and it took me 15 minutes, um, and it's all happening in the chamber. Yeah. So so the question is, how do you clean your sim gas? Um, I'm going to tell you, it is the special characteristics of the torch and it is this unique regenerative cleaning process we have with the squid inside of the gasifier. Once you create a clean syngas, and when I say syngas, I don't mean producer gas, I'm not talking about a dirty gas. Once you have uh, predominantly hydrogen and carbon monoxide as your fuel, we do do a secondary scrubbing, and that's what you saw in this diagram right here. We do a secondary cleanup in case it wasn't all taken care of inside of the gasification chamber. But our only product is hydrogen and carbon monoxide. That's, that's what we produce. That's our, our role. If we have dirty gases or something else in that, then we didn't do our job right. But that's, that's what we're in business to do. Does that answer the question? Sure. Uh, uh -huh. On regulatory side, yes. um, how did you get permits in from Cali to the IWMB and all that? Or is that how you, is that why you collaborate with so the question is, how did we get permitted in Southern California? So uh, the University of Riverside is one of the leading air emissions research institutions in the United States. There's a program there they uh, run called CE CERT, which is very similar in many ways to what I've heard about the Illinois Sustainable uh, Technology Development Center. Um, now, that institution is charged to research materials that reduce emissions 
and reduce greenhouse gases and has uh, provisional permits to operate technologies like ours to find out if they work. This is not a commercial permit. We are not producing electricity for the university and we're not consuming any of their waste to get rid of their garbage. The purpose of our permit and the, um, the way we're operating on that permit is to demonstrate to California that we operate under the same conditions where we operated in Mexico. So, now, by the way, on the regulatory side, we have a lot of data from Mexico. And as we're going throughout Latin America, I mean, I sort of was dismissive in saying that the Mexican data is not acceptable. Well, in fact, the University of Nuevo León is one of the best technical universities in the world. And the data from that university is acceptable at many of the sites, especially in, in Latin America. So um, I was a little bit glib when I said that, and being a Southern Californian, I'm very proud of where I live. But uh, the bottom line is we have a lot of data that's uh, acceptable in the permitting process right now. It takes a long time to get a permit, but at the end of the day, every project that we have is a remediation project. There is no project that we're going into where the use of our technology produces more uh, pollution than is already there. It is, always, uh, it is always impact mitigation. It's always environmental remediation everywhere where we operate our machine. I have a question. Is there a line of search for these documents? No. Uh, that's a very good question. So the question is, what are the solid byproducts? And let, let me just say, where, you know, we talked a lot about air emissions because that's where everybody focuses. So what are the solid and liquid emissions of the plant? There is zero water waste. Uh, because we're not using you know, ammonia and all these other toxic compounds to clean the syngas because we have this unique process with the torches and the squid. We have very few water requirements, period. We do need a gallon of water, but it doesn't need to be potable water uh, in our system per ton. So that's a very low water requirement. 50% of garbage is water, so we can recover a lot of water just from the heat flu, right? Because uh, when, when it's coming in, when we're producing electricity. So water permitting, it's all going to be storm water. You're not going to have any issues with the gasifier producing water. And then the solids analysis, it is going to vary very widely by what you put in the machine in the first place, but with just straight up. Don't forget, garbage is not some random collection of elements. It is stuff that we paid the top dollar for two weeks ago, and we're done with it now. So it is by definition commercial. So everything that's in there, if it can be recovered, is commercial. So the net effect on the solid side is, with ordinary household waste, is going to be zero. Yes, one more question. I just wondered about, you said yes. it's permanently temporary. Yes, so does that, that is not an oxymoron. No, does that affect It's your, like an RV. <laughs> so then but that would affect your requirements for EPA permits as opposed to a temporary uh, setup as opposed to a permanent setup. Mm -hmm. Now, um, all of our customers have different needs. The question now is on uh, permitting and on uh, compliance and the things of this issue. Uh, this issue. Um, in the United States, you have very different requirements between varying geographies. Some of our customers may need, genuinely need, for that system to move around. Let's say a medical waste processor. Uh, we've had uh, groups that operate on the border uh, between Mexico and the United States that want to decommission uh, um, contraband. Um, so uh, there's a lot of needs for temporary permitting. Um, simply the fact that if zero waste advocates and uh, full product planning advocates may eventually eliminate what we call waste today at all is a reason to permit the machine as temporary, right? I mean, if you're a zero waste guy and everything you're saying is let's recycle everything, let's do 100% product life cycle, then you genuinely don't believe that this technology even needs to exist, right? So even that's a reason for having a temporary uh, siting permit. No, that wasn't my first question. Is, does that change the requirements of EPA? Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's a stationary object that's permanently installed or if it's a temporary object that's permanently installed. I imagine that yeah, and once it, so the answer to the question is it depends on what the site requirements are. Um, I don't think the technology itself changes it. So the question is, uh, does the introduction of this technology change EPA requirements? That's the question, because it is temporary by nature, right? Um, the, life, the lifespan of this technology is about 20 years, right? So you buy this machine, 
we expect it to last 20 years. If you don't think it's going to move in that 20 years, you should probably get a stationary permit. Uh, but it's all going to be on a site basis, right? It's not, not really going to have anything to do with the machine itself. It, did I answer your question? You still don't look satisfied. Okay, and, and part of that is because I, I, don't know, I don't know all those rules. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. Okay. So the question uh, is about the solids uh, in the system. First of all, uh, how the impact of calcium carbonate and clay and uh, I forget the other compound, um, what the effect of that is on breaking down the system itself, correct? Isn't that the question? Yeah. Sure. So um, the question is about the abrasivity of the materials that are running through this machine and what are its impact on the long-term lifetime. Correct? Yeah. Because <clears throat> um, I also heard another question, which is, you know, have you looked at your ash analysis and what's the causticity and things like that? Okay. So the short answer to that uh, second question is yes, we have a full ash analysis in our Monterey report, which is available. Um, but to the first question as to the robustness of the machine, there are uh, Parts of the machine that are consumable. Uh, the refractory layer is the most obvious one. But on a daily basis, there are components that we know simply running the system, running the chemical processes, will degrade that part of the system. So that's part of the weekly maintenance of the system. Now, we know because this is not our first gasifier. <laughs> this is, uh, Christian calls it his eighth generation. And the previous generations were operating on very highly caustic, very toxic materials, including refinery sludge, um, all forms of uh, remediated uh, wash waters, and uh, not remediated, but to be remediated, wash waters, and toxic uh, uh, aromatics, and uh, solvents, and things like this. So, uh, Christian has spent most of his career processing really nasty stuff. And that's why I started this whole conversation by saying, you know, we're the Hail Mary pass, we're the caboose on the train. If you can get all that other stuff out through other means, you know, do so, please. But after you're done with that, we have a process that, uh, that uh, takes care of the rest. Now, as for the longevity, I'm the first one to admit this is an emerging technology. And we, we know what we know about operating in Monterey since 2005 and Mexico City for the past two years. We are showing enormous pros promise. You know, we're showing a technology that pays for itself in three years on a product that we think is going to last for 20. And our early adopters have materials that make the machine pay for itself in a year, right? Because these are generally toxic, medical, uh, chemical. Like I said, 75% of the waste stream is going to be those, uh, those industrial medical toxic wastes. So with the evidence that we have so far, it's very promising. Um, 
I think the half-eaten sandwiches should go into an anaerobic digester just like our friend on the internet. But the fact of the matter is, is that every spot is different. And this is not a Swiss army knife. It is not a silver bullet. But in industrial parks, hospitals, these local locations, say this big um, auto manufacturer with a lot of auto flux, say something like that, it's, it's the right tool for the job. And I look forward to working with you to get some of those answers to those other material questions um, here in Champaign if we can. Thank you.